Dr. David Rudiag is best known for his research into the details of the Roswell Crest Retrieval, specifically Lieutenant General Roger Ramey's so-called memo, a telegram he happens to be holding in his hand, face forward, when the infamous weather balloon pictures were taken. This telegram has been photo-analyzed in detail to reveal language that appears to confirm that a crash took place pilots were recovered, and debris had to be shipped to Fort Worth and then to Wright-Patterson Army Airfield. The memo then speaks to the PR effort to cover the incident up with a weather balloon story. Rudiak has reconstructed events that took place in Ramey's office on July 8th, the day when the famous weather balloon photos were taken, including those of Roswell Army Airfield Intelligence Officer Jesse Marcel, who was first to arrive on the scene of the crash, and David has additionally collected the testimony of dozens of folks in Roswell and Corona, the nearest town to the crash site, 75 miles north of Roswell. He may have compiled the most expansive record of evidence, testimony, and stories of Roswell displayed on his site at roswellproof.com. The telegram that Roger Ramey holds in his hand is an army cable written to General Hoyt S. Vandenberg at the Army Air Force Headquarters in Washington, D.C. on July 8, 1947 at 1713 Central Standard Time and written by Lieutenant General Roger Ramey. In this interview segment, directed by Anthony and Robert Miles and produced by Warren Croyl of Alchemy Works and released in the series UFO Chronicles titled The Smoking Gun, which we have under license, David Rudiak speaks to the events that led to the cover-up, as well as his analysis of the Ramey memo. It's a fascinating supplement to the Roswell story, and possibly the true smoking gun that shows a cover-up did take place, that in fact a disc crashed near Roswell, that there were victims identified as aviators in the crash disc, and that they, along with the wreckage, were about to be shipped from Fort Worth, Texas to Wright-Patterson, Ohio, the home of foreign technology research and reverse engineering, either by a B-29 or a C-47. Yes, the memo is that specific. It is important for us to collect those interviews, those research elements, and understand and acknowledge them, even if for some they sound overkill and unnecessary. But collectively, they build a lock clad case against debunkers and anybody who believes the Roswell crash did not take place. Let's listen to Dr. David Rudiak. I've been uh, researching the Roswell incident for about a dozen years now, or maybe 15 years. And uh, my, uh, what I'm best known for is analyzing a photograph of a, uh, a, a telegram, a military telegram that was in the hands of General Roger Ramey. Uh, and this is right in the midst of the Roswell incident. And uh, what happened is the uh, base in Roswell put out a press release that they'd recovered a flying saucer and uh, that they were flying the uh, pieces or whatever it was to Fort Worth, Texas, you know, to see General Ramey. And then uh, about an hour after the press release, General Ramey is saying, oh, it looks to me like it's a weather balloon. So that was uh, his basic story. And then an hour later, he brought in a photographer from the local newspaper and photographs were taken. And you can see in all the photographs, he's holding this slip of paper, but in one, the photographer just by chance happened to get an angle on the front of the paper. And that's what's called the Ramey memo. And uh, we've long wondered what might be on it, and there's speculation that it was a new press release about weather balloons. But uh, starting about a dozen years ago, the photographer assembled a team, and they started to take a look at it, and they got blow-ups. And uh, one of the words they picked out of there was victims, and that got a lot of people like me interested in it, and then we started looking at it. And now we have a pretty good idea of what's in that, uh, that memo. And basically what it is is a general Ramey is communicating with the Pentagon to General Hoyt Vandenberg, who's the uh, acting chief of staff there for the Army Air Force, and he's informing him as to what's happening and what they're planning. So what's happening is they, he says that they found a disc, okay, um, which he may also describe as being a pod or an airfoil, it's a little unclear. 
uh, and the victims of the wreck, you know, that they, that you, meaning Vandenberg, had forwarded to Fort Worth, Texas, possibly to some team there. And then there's the next paragraph, okay, that's what's happening, this is what we're doing about it. Well, they have the bodies, how are they getting them to Fort Worth? Well, they're flying them out, and maybe a C-47, maybe a B-29. We know of a B-29 flight the next day, we have the testimony of the crew, and and uh, one of the people who was guarding, you know, the loading of the, uh, the of this large crate into this box, and the crew said they got to Fort Worth and it was greeted by a mortician because one of the crew members knew the guy and knew he was a mortician. So that was, and it was it was surrounded by an armed guard and chained into this B-29. So they all thought that was very peculiar. Plus, they knew about the rumors of the crash saucer and the little men, you know, that had been recovered outside of town. So I think the, mem uh, the memo was talking about this flight the next day. They were still planning it. They didn't know how they were going to do it. So it says aviators in the disc, I think it says aviators, uh, they will ship, and I think it says to the flight surgeon at Fort Worth. Um, and then they were going to ship them by C-47 or B-29. And then the next, I think, is talking about, uh, well, okay, that's the bodies. What are they doing with the craft that they recovered? Well, I think it says that Wright Field, which is in Dayton, Ohio, where they had the aeronautical labs, they were going to assess this object at Roswell. And it has the words at Roswell in there. And then next it starts talking about, okay, now we're, this is how we're going to cover it up. This is how we're going to deal with it publicly. So at first it says uh, perhaps about noon, a counterintelligence team at Roswell, and we have witnesses there say there are all these strange army counterintelligence guys running around. This counterintelligence team said uh, to, to send out a, what they call the misstate meaning of story, which we think is referring to the press release. In other words, they were giving part of the story, a little bit of truth, but they weren't telling the whole story of what was going on. And the press release said we recovered a flying disc, but didn't say what it was didn't say exactly where, you know, didn't say anything about bodies or a, a disc or whatever. Um, so uh, that's the misstate meaning of the story. And then they said, and they think that the next press release of weather balloons, which was the news story that Ramey was putting out, would work better if they add photos of weather balloons, which Ramey was doing at right that moment, and then do balloon demonstrations afterwards. Okay, so, uh, and then we, I've been able to document a whole number of uh, military balloon demonstrations that followed in the next few days. In fact, they were openly bragging about it. Uh, they were saying, uh, you know, they were trying to kill the saucer report. So the Army and Navy was engaged in this, what they called a concentrated campaign to stop the rumors. So that, they were saying, we're debunking the saucers. I mean, they were very open about it. They weren't hiding it. So uh, that's the Ramey memo, and it's signed by Ramey. And I think the last part, he's, he's this, the counterintelligence team was saying, uh, we think we need to add visuals, okay, to uh, just a simple uh, re a release saying that, oh, it's just a weather balloon, isn't going to convince anybody. We think we need photos. So that's why Ramey was, had his weather balloon at his feet at that moment. It, this photo was taken, and then why they had the balloon demos afterwards. Uh, so that's the Ramey memo, and it's a bit different from the modern Air Force story that, oh, it's just a mogul balloon, and, you know, and there weren't any bodies, and it's all exaggerated and made up. So that's, that's that. Okay, one of the interesting things is we've been able to trace um, things that were happening back at the Pentagon, particularly with General Vandenberg. Uh, there isn't anything I've been able to find with Truman. It all looks very clean and sanitary. But there were things going on with Vandenberg which are very suspicious, although you can't say, point and say, that's a smoking gun, like I would call the Ramey memo. Uh, and um, Vandenberg's uh, involvement, public involvement, uh, from you know, quotes in the newspaper started on July 5th. The, Ramey, the incident, you know, with the press release on the base was July 8th, the afternoon. So uh, Vandenberg is, is in uh, Texas at that time, which, is, which I thought was a little suspicious, but I think he was just doing a political favor for a congressman. 
He's returning to Washington on July 5th, and he's asked about the flying saucers. And one woman says, are they Russians? You know, do the Russians have the secret of the flying saucer? And he says, uh, well, we're, we're looking into it. We've received thousands of inquiries. You know, he says that. And we're, we've been looking into it intensively since, I think he said, July 2nd, maybe July 1st. So he admits that they're investigating. He doesn't say anything beyond that. Then he gets back to Washington, which would be, you know, this was the weekend, July 5th. July 7th is Monday. And there he is in his, um, his log, you know, which is in the Library of Congress. He's with General Curtis LeMay, who's the Deputy Director of Research and Development for the Army Air Force. And LeMay is briefing him on the flying disks because there's just all these reports in the newspapers and the Pentagon is obviously getting flooded with phone calls about it. So Vandenberg is personally taking calls from a newspaper in Canada asking what they are and he's noncommittal. He's, there's a hoax disc story, crash disc story going on in Houston where somebody claims to have found a disc and it has Army Air Force, you know, printed on it. So he's trying, he is personally spending a lot of time with LeMay trying to kill that story and he's telling his people, you know, he's calling his people in Houston and says, kill this story, do whatever you can to kill the story, which is itself kind of curious. And I sort of suspect that he already knew what was going on in Roswell, and he was afraid that might spread, you know, and get the press curious at that time, and they were trying to contain it. What was going on in Roswell, according to uh, the base public information, Walter, uh, public information officer Walter Hott, who in an affidavit that came out in 2007, is he said Ramey, or not Ramey, excuse me, that uh, he was aware of the, them investigating this debris field northwest of town on July 7th when he got back to his office. But then later in the day, he heard that they had found a craft and body site north of town, closer into town, and had been discovered by civilians earlier that day. So back in Washington, Vandenberg has been informed of this, and so now they're really concerned. You know, they have this craft and body site. We don't know exactly when, but so Vandenberg in the early afternoon is trying to kill this, this disc story down in Houston. And then at 2.30, he has a, a dental appointment, but he cancels it. And he goes out to the airport to personally greet uh, the Air, Army Air Force Secretary, Stuart Symington. And uh, that is very peculiar because he's out of his office, according to his log, for an hour and a half. Why would he go out and personally greet and bring Symington back to the Pentagon? Uh, and I think that's because at that point he was aware of what was happening, the new things that were happening in Roswell, and it was urgent business. So it couldn't wait for Symington to get back. He had to talk to him immediately. So he comes back and he goes, immediately goes into a meeting at the Pentagon with Symington. Just as he's getting back, Carl Hatch, who's one of the senators, um, or is it Dennis Chavez? I forget. It may have been Dennis Chavez. Uh, he calls Truman at the White House. Actually, his son calls for him, but and he requests a special meeting with Truman, which does take place uh, two days later on July 9th in the morning. So what was that about? We don't know because, you know, there's nothing in, in the Truman's logs or anything like that that says what the meeting was about. But it's just very curious. There are all these coincidences going on. That's the thing. There are just dozens of little coincidences like this. So uh, Carl Hatch or Dennis Chavez is requesting this meeting with Truman. Uh, and then that's all we have for Vandenberg the next day. But the next morning is when things really hop are hopping. And then the public information officer, Walter Hott, says General Ramey had flown out to Roswell with his chief of staff, Colonel DeBose. Who, who admitted that they, they staged a cover-up in, in Fort Worth. Uh, and there was a morning meeting at 7.30 that morning. And they're, and they're discussing the two crash sites. Uh, the debris is passed around for everybody to look at, and nobody knew what it was. And then General Ramey, they discussed whether the public should be told something, and Ramey says, no, we've decided to cover it up. And uh, Walter Hoth said, I think he was getting his orders from the Pentagon. So um, 
Now, what's interesting here is back in Washington at the Pentagon, uh, General Vandenberg cancels a previously scheduled meeting, and he calls a two and a half hour meeting. This is at exactly the same time as, as this morning meeting in Roswell. He calls a two and a half hour meeting of the Joint Research and Development Board. And there's a whole backstory on the Joint Research and Development Board. This was a, um, uh, it was chaired by Dr. Vannevar Bush of the Car Carnegie Institute, who had been the nation's science research and development czar during World War II. He was one of the most important men in the government. And they did all the uh, military you know, research and development during the war. And then they, the Defense Department or the War Department set up this Joint Research and Development Board afterwards to continue that. And so he's in charge of that. Two and a half years later, uh, th these Canadian documents um, were written by a Canadian ra uh, radio engineer named Wilbert Smith and also from the Canadian Embassy in Washington uh, talking about a uh, super secret saucer study committee within the Research and Development Board headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. Okay, so this is the same group. Uh, the Joint Research and Development Board, three weeks later with the passage of the National Security Act, became the Research and Development Board, and Bush was appointed the first chair of that, but he's still within the Research and Development Board in 1950 when uh, this Wilbert Smith was given this briefing in Washington saying the saucers are real, they're classified higher than the H-bomb, and this secret committee, you know, headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush within the Research and Development Board is looking into the modus operandi, you know, how, how the saucers work, basically. And then it says, and they're, they're also talking about mental aspects of the whole phenomenon, which is interesting. The, 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 uh, the Wilbert Smith memo, they mention these four things that he was briefed about, and then he says, uh, and we, there was also discussion about mental aspects of the flying saucers. And we don't know exactly what that means, but it could be referring to telepathic communications, which is very interesting because I've never seen that in any other document. You know, of, of the thousands of UFO documents, I've never seen that mentioned. But they were talking about this in 1950. As, as to the paper trail with Roswell, basically there is none. But that's in itself curious because this was a huge news story. Okay, uh, it, it tied up the phone lines in the Pentagon for an entire afternoon and into the evening. They got probably thousands of phone calls. The newspapers mentioned the phone lines into New Mexico and Texas being tied up. So this was a huge news story. It was headline news. Um, and yet, there's no paper trail, you know. The Pentagon, it says Vandenberg right in the middle of this. This is about 45 minutes after the press release went out over the wire. He leaves his office. He goes to the Pentagon press room and personally handles the situation, directing calls to New Mexico and Texas. Now, okay, what's happening, guys? Like I said, if he didn't know. but. <laughs> But he, you know, he's putting on a show. Uh, but you think Vandenberg would be very upset with this? You know, I had to disrupt my schedule to deal with a weather balloon. I mean, there would be, there would have been an investigation. How could you guys, you know, screw up that badly? Misidentify a simple weather balloon? No investigation. There's no paper trail. The only government document that's ever been found in this was an FBI telegram that was written out of Dallas, where they're called by one of the intelligence people, you know, at Fort Worth, and they said, oh, it's just a weather balloon and it's attached radar target. Uh, we're shipping it to Wright Field uh, because uh, phone tele uh, conversations with them, they don't disagree, they disagree with the weather balloon story. They don't say why. They say, oh, we don't think it's a weather balloon. Well, that's because Colonel DuBose's Chief of Staff, uh, I mean, not Colonel DeBose, but General Ramey's Chief of Staff, Colonel DeBose, told us that Washington ordered a special flight of debris flown probably in July 6th when the rancher reported the crash. They wanted this debris flown to Washington. It was a super secret ship in a debris, and then it was flown onto Wright Field. So they'd already seen the debris. 
And I think that's why the FBI is told, or they talk to Wright Field, and Wright Field told the FBI, we don't think it's a weather balloon. Okay, so they say that, and the other interesting thing is uh, General Ramey said, oh, we've canceled the flight to Wright Field, it's just a weather balloon. Uh, <laughs> but the FBI is saying, no, we're shipping it off to Wright Field, and Wright Field doesn't think it's a weather balloon.